All right. Hush, how you doing? What up, man? Not much, man. Appreciate you taking the time. We're out here in Detroit. Welcome to Detroit. Yeah, beautiful city. Sometimes. Oh. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> We're downtown. Um, a lot of people might not know who you are. A lot of people do know who you are. Um, you know, you have a lot of accolades for your music and, and everything. And um, you also have known Eminem since you were, I believe, 22 years old? Yeah. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, yourself and how did you get started with music? Well, I have been rapping since I was like 12 years old, fascinated with, you know, all the greats, you know, all the goats, all everybody that they put in there, you know, all the old school dudes that people put in their top five, you know, the Big Daddy Canes, the Rakims, the, you know, the KRS-1s, Chuck D's, Ice T's. Um, those were my heroes growing up and watching them and watching their videos and hearing their music just was like a major impact in my life so um, I just started I picked up a pad and just started trying to write my own raps um, I used to basically just take their songs and make them either dirty or make them funny and change the words and do stuff like that that was like my thing to do when I was 12 and but then I, I really started taking it serious when I was about 16 um, and just thought that that was something that I really wanted to do. Um, and just kept on pushing, pushing my pen and trying to, you know, focus on certain things that, that I liked in each one of my, you know, idols. You know, like I love Slick Rick storytelling, so I tried to develop how to write stories, you know, and make them so that they were, you know, listenable to, to you know, to, to fans or somebody who was listening could understand the story there's a beginning a middle and an end um, but then I also did you know then I also studied like Rakim and and Big Daddy Kane and their syllable styles and and tried to you know rhyme different patterns and you know I used to literally like write out their words and count and put numbers above their their words and see okay there's 17 syllables here now I'm, then right below that I would write my own sentences to, to match theirs so my rhymes would have the same kind of syllable pattern and then through that I kind of just developed my own style um, but it wasn't until about 95 that um, I really like 90 93 94 95 that I really took it serious about this is what I want to do for a living and really make a business and really make a go at you know being a, a you know a professional rapper all right. Okay. So, so as you're progressing and, and you're learning your style and everything, what was the scene like in Detroit? The scene was incredible. Um, I was too young, and really, I, I was just I, I I was disconnected from the Detroit rap scene in in the fact that I couldn't get into the clubs that these guys, the Detroit rappers, were performing at. So, you had greats like. Awesome Dre and the Hardcore Committee, or you had Prince Vince uh, and the Hip Hop Squad, you had Chaos and Maestro, you had Easy B and DJ Los, who to me were, th that group was the ones that made me really believe, like between Easy B and DJ Los and Awesome Dre, that I could really be a Detroit rapper. Like listening to their raps and seeing them, you know, hearing how put together their stuff was. Um, it was really, uh, you know, it, it fit in the mold of what was going on at the time um, of the, the late 80s, uh, mid to late 80s, um, and even some of the early 90s um, as like Awesome Dre kind of broke into like the 90s, like in the, in the like I'd say 90, um, 91. The scene was really, uh, I'd say it was like a real street scene. The rap's real street. Um, there really was no, you know, pomp and, you know, like just trying to, you know, make it really, you know, just really, you know, eccentric or anything like that. We, we didn't have rappers like that. You know, flashy rappers. We didn't have flashy rappers. We had street rappers that, that the street people, people in the streets knew these guys for real. Like we had a group called Rap Mafia. These dudes literally got busted selling dope 
in their, while they were shooting their video. <laughs> they were selling real dope in their video and got busted. Like, and some of them dudes went away for a while, you know. Um, you know, it, it, our, our street, our, 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 the street scene, the, the, the hip hop scene here was real. You know, everything that you heard these guys talk about, you knew was the real deal. So it was a lot different than what we heard from New York or L.A. or whatever, because we heard we heard both coasts. You know, we knew that L.A. was more the gangster stuff because of Ice-T and N.W.A. But then the East Coast stuff, you know, had many different type of people. You know, it was it wasn't just uh, somebody like a cool G rap or somebody like that. So, you know, we had I'd say we had dedicated like every that that scene was dedicated to Detroit. They were real Detroit, you know, street rappers that were just incredible as as artists you know we had awesome dre who actually got a deal got a record deal i remember him being on the cover of yo magazine he went on tour with public enemy like i was like i want to be him like i was all about that like i remember he had his the cover of his album he had he had a a gauge and a tech nine pointed at the heads of two guys that were on their knees and those dudes were dressed like LL and Kumo D. <laughs> and, and the building we're in, which was called the Renaissance Center back then, it's the GM building now, but that was in the background of the, of the, of the shot. So it, this is like a very iconic building we're in. So a lot of Detroit rappers put this on the, their album covers back in the 80s. So yeah, it's crazy. Was there a lot of battle rapping going on? There was a lot of battle rapping, but the battle raps were always in, in school. So at lunchtime, you know, or like before lunch would hit, you know, people were hyping it up. Like, oh, I'm a battle. What's his name? Blah, blah, blah. And then you'd have your, your homeboy at the, at the table making the beat on the table, you know, and then somebody would be across from you and you just you you and people would be all gathered around in a circle lunchtime you just go at it and that's that's pretty much how it was I mean I, I and I know it was like that it in many schools because to hear proof tell me stories about it to hear my boy champ town tell me about how him and Isham used to to do this used to you know battle people at Osborne High and and stuff like that like I know that that's that's kind of it, it seems like that's the place for us to battle there really was no um I guess th there really was no structured battles you know where it was like okay uh Thursday at seven o'clock at this club everybody's gonna meet and we're gonna battle nobody ever had that until um you know, basically, uh, I didn't see any of that in the in the scene because I wasn't I wasn't around the scene. I was away for a couple of years on vacation, <laughs> and uh, um, when I came back from vacation, um, there were battles at the hip hop shop. You said you moved to Cali, and then you came back, and this is when you really started to pursue things heavy again. Yeah, when I came back from Cali, that's when I decided, like, I'm going to jump into this head first and, you know, really start to figure out how I'm going to make this happen. So I started to line myself up with certain people that I knew were in the scene and were connected somehow to the scene that, that could be a conduit for me to get to the place that I needed to get to as a professional rapper. So um, one of the, the first people I ever met, he's, he's now known as Cheddar Bob, um, DJ Rec. Um, he's definitely one of the first people that, he actually is the first person that, that put me on the scene, like drove me to, the, you know, to St. Andrews, drove me to the hip hop shop, drove me to uh drove me to to after hour spots like the red door till four o'clock in the morning and you know and uh introduced me to a lot of people in the scene before i actually started putting 
my thoughts and ideas of how I was going to do it together. Um, he introduced me to a guy named Mike. I don't, I don't, he had a DJ name. I don't remember what his DJ name was. He, he actually just passed away. He, um, he had an EPS 16 sampling keyboard and he used to make some dope beats and it was all boom bap stuff. And, uh, while he was entertaining in his house, because we, we were always over his house for parties or whatever, and I was always in his room because he had records all over the place. He had this keyboard. He was making beats. My f focus was always on that. While he's in the other room hanging out with girls or doing whatever, I was always in his room jumping on his keyboard, learning how to do whatever. And then I eventually bought my own keyboard and then started making my own beats and then started putting my own group together. Which is, and then I met a, a, this other guy named Nacho, and we put a group together called the Ruckus. Um, it didn't really last between Nacho and I. We had different, different views on the way it should be. Um, and then I hooked up with this guy named Uncle Ill. And uh, Uncle Ill and I just, we, 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 he took it as serious as I did. He loved hip hop as much as I did. He loved the same artists I did. His, his influences, his inspirations were all the same as mine. So us doing, us doing an album together sounded like something that would be fun. And I kind of was working on a solo album and he was just like, well, why don't you let me jump on a couple of them tracks? So I let him jump on a couple of them tracks and I said, well, you know, I do have this group, The Ruckus, that I really ain't done nothing with. You know, if you want to get, if you want to be down, we can, we can make it a group. And so, we, that was like the official stamp in like 95. Um, we put an album out called Quiet Is Kept and we sold about 5,000 units. I'd say five, between five and 6,000 units out the trunk on our own, which for Detroit at the time in like 95 was, was kind of a big deal because most of the other most of the other rappers were always trying to get record deals. You know, if I get a record deal, it means I'm going to get distributed and I don't got to worry about nothing and and that sort of stuff. And me and Uncle Ill were like, well, we can just do it ourselves. Like we we know what we're doing. You know, I drew the logo. I came up with a production company. We trademarked it. We got with a lawyer. Um, you know, and then we ended up uh, selling all, all this stuff out the trunk. And that got us noticed uh, by a record label called Federation Records and a guy named Mark Kempf um, here and also a guy named Rico Shelton and their other partner who was kind of like a silent partner, um, DJ AMF. So we put an album out with them called Episode One and that's the album that really took off for us. It was okay. about 97, we put that out. Okay. and. So as you're progressing through music, at some point you meet Eminem. Yeah. How did all that come about? So Eminem's producer and the guy he was living with, his roommate at the time was a guy named Mannix. Um, Mannix was producing my old group partner, Nacho, on a solo deal after we split up. Um, and I kept hearing about Marshall because he lived in the same neighborhood as I did on the east side. And... Um, I had a, we had a mutual friend named Champ Town, uh, this guy named Brian Harmon. And Brian and I went to high school together. And uh, Brian was also friends with Kid Rock, who I was also, uh, you know, I was cool, not cool with, but we knew of each other. Um, same with Uncle Cracker. Like we, we kind of knew the same people. And Brian and I went to high school together and Brian and I reconnected at some point and Brian had told me about, you know, this guy, Eminem, who he wanted to give, a, you know, wanted to give him a record deal through his own label. He just wanted uh, Eminem to um, be a little bit more patient because he, he was trying to get a distribution company uh, to back his label, Straight Jacket Records. And uh, he, you know, he kept telling Marshall, like, you know, I'm going to do this and he got Marshall in the studio and took him to like Paisley Park. Um, and at this time, Champ Town's group partner was Uncle Ill. And that's how I met 
my future group partner in the ruckus because Uncle Ill ended up leaving Champtown and, and con him and I connected. Um, so I met M through, uh, I w came over their house one day really to see Nacho and, and to hear some of the new music through this guy Mannix who had beats and I wanted to hear what he was doing because he was using the same equipment I was using. And uh, M just happened to be there one day and you know, we just kind of like grazed hands, like, you know, what's up, you know, cool. Kim was there. And, um, and then that, that kind of was just it, that it just fell flat after that. Like it, it really was no, you know, chummy chum, hanging out, none of that stuff. Um, but then at some point, uh, Champ Town was accused of, of trying to hit on Kim or try to sleep with Kim. And, was, was uh, that, did Eminem have any albums out at this point? Eminem had, uh, yeah, Eminem had Infinite album out. Um, Were you around when he released that or did he oh already yeah, have that release? I was around for that. Okay, what was, uh, what was that experience like? Well, no, I was around the scene. Oh, okay. But okay. was not around for the recording Infinite. I was around for the recording of the Slim Shady EP, though. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but in between Infinite and the Slim Shady EP, there's this moment where Champ Town gets accused of sleeping with Kim. Um, Kim had secretly recorded some conversations on the phone between Champ and her, and Marshall had the cassette of it, and he, you know, played it and, and uh, at some point I kind of just stepped in because I was more I felt more loyal to Brian Champ Town um, because we went to high school together we grew up together um, and and Champ was Champ was like the local hero at my high school because he was a uh, he was on tour with Public Enemy and you know and LL and all these people so I mean, and basically, he was more on tour with Ice T than anything. I think um, he kind of like he was like a roadie, but rapping and hyping crowds up, and he was just an all-around entertaining guy. And but he would come back with the the tour coats and all that stuff at high school, and we were just like, oh, man, you know, it's like that dude's around Chuck D. Like, you know, we were all just like, man, he's the dude, you know. So when I finally got to be around him, him and I got really close. And so I, I believed his story that, you know, he wasn't trying to holler at Kim. And I kind of got in the middle of that. And some words were exchanged between Marshall and I, and him and I ended up in a, in a fight in front of his house. Um, take, take me through that. How'd you guys, so you guys ended up on the phone arguing? No, um, his DJ, DJ Butterfingers at the time was, um, I was cool with, which was actually Mannix's brother. They, they were twins, Mike and Matt. Um, Mannix did the production. His twin brother did, was the DJ. They all lived in the same house. And there was another guy also there named Chaos Kid. And that formed Basement Productions. So it was Mannix, Butterfingers, Chaos Kid, and Eminem. That was Basement Productions. Um, this is pre-Infinite, actually. Um, and then I kind of got into a face-to-face -face with Marshall at his job, called Kim out of her name, and Marshall didn't like that. We left with words being said. I went home, and I was living with Champ at the time, and uh, ended up on the phone with Butter, and Butter said, uh, Marshall said next time he sees you, he's fucking you up. Now, I don't, I'm, I'm not no punk. I don't come from that. I'm, I'm an east side dude till I die. And when st somebody says something like that, you, you don't wait for it to come to you, you take it to them. That's, that's just the code, you just, that's the way it is. And uh, I, felt, I felt weird, because it, it really wasn't my beef, you know what I mean? But, but 
I also was taken up from my boy and, and now I'm in it. And then he says he's gonna fuck me up. Well, now I gotta take it to him. So uh, I hung up the phone, Champ and I go over to his house. He gets out the car. He's pulling up at the exact same time. Me and Champ get out the car. He gets out his car. I just walked up to him and just socked him in the face. So we just get to scrapping. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, ironic as it may be, I was wearing a white hoodie that day, a, a white Nike hoodie. And uh, he was on the ground and I just remember him like throwing this crazy, I call it the crazy white boy rage. He just like, ah, like stood up real fast. And his collarbone, I was going down to hit him and his collarbone, he came up real fast and his collarbone hit me right in the bridge of my nose and just blew out my shit. Like all over, I had blood all over my white hoodie and I lost it. I went crazy. and started kicking him and shit and um, Marshall later told me that you know, I broke some of his ribs you know and and all that and then um, I remember another guy came there also um, because he, this dude Joe came there because Chaos Kid owed him money for weed or something and I just remember I look out, like, and they're fighting on the side of the house, and Joe's got Chaos Kid up against the wall, up against the side of the house, and he's slamming him up against the side of the house. It was just crazy. And um, we just left, and uh, I remember leaving, and uh, a week later, I'm in St. Andrews by myself. And I just came from a wedding reception. Now, St. Andrews is like the big hip hop spot. Everybody went there. Everybody went there to battle. Everybody went there to, to hear DJ House Shoes play, break, you know, play somebody's record. Jay Dilla might show up and you know, plug in his dat recorder and play something that they just recorded that you'll never hear ever again. This, just so he could play it to get your response if you liked it. Then they just took that re recorder and left. Like, you didn't know, you know what was going to happen, but it, f Friday nights at, at St. Andrews was the shit. So um, I remember I went there and I had a suit on and a ton of Eminem's friends or people that were like hangers on, I, I should say. This was like no D12 members, no, nobody like that. No, no proof, no, no nobody, nobody like that. These were just do suburb kids that would hang out with him, whatever, that, that loved rap, that were, you know, just thought that he was cool and whatever. They kept coming up to me going, well, Marshall's here, he's gonna fuck you up. Marshall's here, you, you, you ought to be scared, Marshall's here. And finally I was like, I'm here by myself. Go, go get Marsh. So they went and got him and, and uh, he's like, let's go over here and talk. So we went over to the side and, uh, and he was like, look, man, you know, I know why, why we fought, but you need to know that your boy really tried to holler at my girl. I can play you the tape. You need to listen to it. Like, I said, I want to hear it. Play it for me. So he took me out to the car and played me the tape. And I heard the whole conversation between them two. Now, it's debatable if he's trying to holler at her or, or she's trying to holler at him or whatever like she could have been trying to you know wrap him up in some bullshit too because girls are scantless like that but it the way the tape the way it sounded on the tape it could have been spliced it could, might not have been but whatever but the way it was on the tape it sounded like he was trying to holler at her to this day he he says it you know that ain't like they they you know they made it sound like that like they spice shit together and they did all this stuff and you know he's like I never tried to holler at her she tried to holler at me and then you know and then I called her the second time and that's when she finally rec she recorded me on the second phone call but nobody heard the first phone call where she was trying to holler at me because champ champ was the man at, I mean at one point he was the guy that like I said he would he took Marshall to Paisley Park Studios 
to record. I mean, this is Prince's studio, you know, and took him around, you know, and, and you know, put him in a studio and recording things, put him in his video and, and things like that. So, you know, to a guy, a, a guy who's barely coming up, his girlfriend, who doesn't know this world, sees that it could be something that's, you know, definitely alluring to a female. You know, like, I mean, he's, he's really the guy I should be with, not this guy. Right. But that's not how the conversation sounded. So, um, at least the way I, that I had heard it. So, he was like, you know, we can, we can squash this beef, like right now. Let, why don't we just squash it? And I was like, yeah, we, we can squash it. And literally, like, after that, a lot of things changed for me. Like, Uncle Ill and Champ Town, well, Champ Town didn't really know that Uncle Ill was splitting from him. But he, Uncle Ill kind of split from him and then ended up at my house listening to beats that I was making. And then we put our group together. And as our group was coming out in 97, so was the Slim Shady EP. And during that whole time, I'm around Marshall as he's recording it, you know, in certain places. I did all the sound effects like for like Murder, Murder. Um, what else? I mean, there's a couple other tracks on that, on that uh, Just the Two of Us, um, you know. You did the sound effects? You, yeah. you, uh, like the baby yeah. and all that? Yeah, and Murder, Murder, like the cash register, you know, uh, clean out the register, uh, do it before somebody catches you. You know, and, and uh, you know, um, the whole, just any, he, he wanted to make it like, you know, he wanted to put you in the mind of it visually. So you could close your eyes, hear, hear the story, but with the sound effects to it, it paints a cinematic picture of it. And he really wanted to put you in that, you know, you know. What was he like back then? It was cool as was fuck. That. It was cool as fuck. Honestly, he was cool as fuck. Like, he was very, he was a very, he's still the same guy, like, as I see him now today. He's a very reserved guy, um, very, uh, very, very to himself in the fact that, like, you know, he, was, he, was, he wasn't private, but he was also embarrassed. Of his of his lifestyle and the where how he was living, you know, like like he was homeless at one point. I remember him taking me to uh, his mother's trailer, you know, where he was living at, barely living at where his mother was, and and you know, like I mean, it was it wasn't it wasn't good, you know, his his whole life just rap was his the focus and that was his way out for real. Like was this before he had a baby? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So he was homeless at one point? Yeah. Sheesh. Yeah. But, um, Lost his job. He used to work at Little Caesars. Like, he did a lot of odd jobs. He worked at Gilbert's Lodge um, around the time. He worked at Little Caesars back before Gilbert's Lodge, but around the time that we were hung in, hanging out, he was still working at Gilbert's Lodge um, as a cook. And... Uh, him and I were living parallel lives, so we kind of like, we kind of latched on to each other as friends because we both had women that were pregnant two weeks apart. So they were having their babies two weeks apart. We were both white rappers in Detroit, working 10 times harder, we felt, than black rappers were to make it. Um, because, you know, we had felt like we had so much we had to prove, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. Like most people would have just been like, who are these vanilla ice motherfuckers? You know, cause that was really, I mean, yeah, we had third base and we had, you know, beasties and, you know, but as far as solo artists, like that's, that's the only dude we had that really fucked it up for everybody so you know at the end of the day we were just like doing the same following the same path I you know I'd pick him up um take him to all the black open mics 
Nobody had taken him to any of the black open mics. He had never done any of the black open mics. There was a C Note Lounge. So you were there when he first did an open mic? Or? I was there when he was doing the black open mics. So he didn't want to do them. There was a white open mic? Well, no, like the black clubs okay. that were mostly in the hood, the hood clubs. Then you had the suburb spots. So, you know, there's, there were different... Detroit is a very multicultural place when it comes to hip-hop. Always has been. You know, oh, the way it's portrayed in 8 Mile is more like, you know, Rocky, you know where you've got this guy versus all of, you know, a whole demographic of people. If you watched 8 Mile and you see the battle scenes, it's all black in the crowd. That's not how Detroit was. Detroit had, we've got a huge Spanish community. We've got an Arab community. We've got a white community. We've got a black community, poor community. We've got a middle class community. We've got, you know, we had female B-girls. They used to be there. We had break dancers in the crowd that were white, black, Asian, you name it. So. And everybody had their own groups though. Everybody was grouped off? No, everybody was all together. But when it came to open mics in the hood, it was mostly like, like tucked away black clubs. Gotcha. So, so C-Note would have an open mic night and it, like off Seven Mile and Van Dyke, if you, if you know Seven Mile and Van Dyke area, it's hood, it's straight hood. You ain't gonna see no white boys in there. They're not just gonna walk up in there and jump on a mic, it just don't happen. But I grew up on the east side, I grew up in Detroit, so none of that was, meant anything to me. That's where I grew up at. So I'd, walking in those places was easy for me. I knew how dope this dude was, that I was like, yo, you need to come to C-Note and spit that shit you just spit last week. And he was like, you think I should do that? I'm like, fuck yeah. Like, D like, you, need to, like you need to be killing motherfuckers out here. Like, like, and I, all right, he'd be like, all right, let's go. Put him in the car, take him to C-Note. He'd jump on the mic. He would just do like, just don't give a fuck verse. And, or, or no one's iller verse or, um, uh, or just a freestyle that he'd had already made up in his head. Um, and then, you know, we'd leave. And then the next week, I'm like, yo, you, you need to come to Ebony Showcase. You need to come to Ebony Showcase. Oh, I've been hearing about Ebony Showcase, but I don't, I don't know if that's the place for me to go. Like, no, you need to go do that. Let, you need to come there. Like, I just performed there. Like, you need to come there. All right, and get in the car go there what were the reactions that he was getting he got he got i mean people were like in awe like damn this white boy's dope you know and our, our was he ever nervous like an eight oh mile? yeah 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 he was always nervous no question throwing did he ever throw up like in eight mile or no nah, i never seen him throw up no, no nothing like that but he had a white nike air hat and he always used to keep it the brim was like cuffed like that so you couldn't see his eyes and he would just keep his head head down he didn't really like make eye contact with the crowd like that and it's just like he wanted to be one with the lyrics and get it out so you heard it and that was and when it came across man you just knew this there wasn't there was nobody ever going to stop this dude when he went to um I remember he went to Scribble Jam and he lost. He, went to, he, he did a, a show here. He opened up for Razzcaz here. And we were all there. Um, I forget who else was on that bill. So I remember him uh, going down to, I believe it was Cincinnati for Scribble Jam. And he had like $20 in his pocket. I remember him coming back from Scribble Jam and he was, he was I don't want to say devastated, but he was disappointed. That's what, the best what word. What place did he come in? Second. Second. He fought, he battled Juice. A juice, okay. juice was dope. Was this his first big battle? I think so. Were you there? I was not there. You weren't there. I was not there. Um, 
Um, and I just remember when he came back, I remember him and I kicking it. We used to drive around freestyle in the car. He would help me with my lines. You know, you should say this this way. You should bend this word this way. You know, you should syllable this way. Um, and then I would listen to what he's saying, and I barely ever told him what he should be doing. But once in a while, I'd throw a line out there like, nah, you shouldn't say that. Don't, don't say that. You should say, you should rhyme it with this. And he'd be like, oh, yeah, you know what? I didn't think about that. And it's weird hearing somebody say that they didn't think about that when they're already like somewhat of a savant with the dictionary already. And, um, but I remember telling him he was getting ready to go do the Rap Olympics. Okay, wait, wait uh, did he already have the Shady uh, LP recorded? No. Okay, nope. so this is before he, he started recording that. He hadn't even started, but um, he, well, I mean, he had a couple tracks, but they ended up becoming different. The production ended up becoming different once he got signed to Interscope and, and Aftermath because the, the budget was better. You know, they were able to, the quality had to be there for his debut. And a lot of the quality on the, the stuff he was doing sounded more like demos as opposed to a national record. Um, I remember the, like the Bad Meets Evil record with Royce and him on the Slim Shady LP. There's a whole nother version of that produced by um, um, uh, this guy named Doc Seuss from here who was part of Royce's crew back in the day called Wall Street here. I always thought that was the way better version than the one that ended up on the album. But when you listen to it, it's out there, it's on YouTube. It's very, uh, it's very demo-y. Like it's super, the quality would not have been good for it. Um, what were you guys thinking when he wrote songs about killing his baby's mom? Was you, it, <laughs> you know what? Were you there um, when he recorded those? I remember, the, I remember that stuff and I, I'll see there was, there's so many different times where stuff like that happened. Like after, when he got his record deal with Dre, well, let me just go back though, because when he went to Rap Olympics, I told him, they're gonna come at you with written verses. That's how you lost. I, that's at least how I believed it. Like, because our way of freestyling was completely off the top of the head. And Marshall was really good at that. He could tear you apart just by how you looked. He could, he could obliterate you. Don't, don't show up with like looking bummy or have, or have you know, uh, a, a simple shirt on that has letters on it, like five letters in the word, you know, because he'll, he'll take each one of those letters and make it stand for something against you. He was very witty and smart like that. But I knew that I had already known, and I know he had knew that New York free version of freestyling and LA's version of freestyling was more written, written verses that nobody had ever heard before. Well, Marshall didn't come at people like that with battles. He came at them off the top of the head and incinerated them. But he, he, it was hard to incinerate somebody who already had the metaphors planned out, the syllables already, the punchlines already planned out. It's hard to beat somebody who's already got that, who's already got, uh, you know, 10 sick ass punchlines. When you're trying to come up with punchlines off the top of your head, you ain't, you're gonna lose. So I told him, you go to the Rap Olympics, you better have, you better hit him with some written verses. And he did a mixture of that together and that, that helped get him noticed. I know that for a fact, because if you watch some of the, I wasn't there, but if you watch some of the footage from that, you can tell what's, what's written and what's not. There's a lot of lines that I had heard, you know, him spit at the Rap Olympics that he had spit here before he got there. So, you know, I, I, was, I was proud to, to, to be like, you know, here's a dude from Detroit that just and what place did he come in the Rap Olympics? I don't, I don't. Was he second there too? It was something like that, yeah. But he was with Corrupt. He was around Corrupt. He was around Exhibit. He was around, you know, Raz Cass. He was, you know, he was around those dudes. And, and um, but somehow the Slim Shady EP 
ended up getting falling into the hands of DJ, who was Jimmy Iovine's nephew, who worked who was worked at Interscope, who brought it back to LA, and you know DJ was hot on it and told his you know told his uncle, and one day Dre came over and Jimmy was like, "You need to hear this." Dre didn't even know he was white. Think about that. That's how dope he was. Like he just. There was no, it was just all, of, everybody was just so focused on the, the dopeness of his rhymes, his words, his wordplay, his cadence, his flow, his punchlines, like his metaphors that nobody was checking for color, you know? Right. That when they finally do, they're like, what the fuck? And he's white? Like, damn. So, you know, he had just the two of us. He had Bad Meets Evil. He had a couple songs in the bag before um, the Slim Shady LP was recorded. But My those? Name Is was the first one they did right out the gate. Right, right, when they got there. My Name Is, Role Model, and Still Don't Give a Fuck. What was it like when he was recording those songs? Because it, I mean, it, they don't seem as wild now, but back in the 90s, you know, that was, I remember when it came out, it was like, yo, this dude's rapping about killing his baby's mom. You know what? It wasn't, it, to be honest with you, we saw some shit around him and Kim that we knew he wasn't serious, but we knew, we knew the shit was, you know, we knew how he felt, you know, it was his way of venting and getting that off his chest. I mean... Debbie, Debbie, his mother, and my mother were cool. They were phone pals, okay? So Debbie would call my mother up on the phone. They'd, they'd talk on the phone like girls, high school girls, and just talk, 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 talk. And Kim, at this time, was working at a massage parlor. Debbie calls my mom up. You need to get Hush. You need to get Hush to go get Marshall. He's going to kill her. He's, got, he's on his way. He just found out. He thinks that she's fucking her manager. You need to go. You need, Hush needs to go over there and get Marshall. And my mom's like, my mom's like on the other end of the phone looking at me. And she's like, oh, my God. Like, you know, Debbie's losing it. Like, something's going on. And she hung up. She was like, all right, all right, Debbie, all right. She got off the phone. She's like, you need to go get Marshall. He's, he's on his way to, to that massage parlor where Kim works, and he's going to kill her. He thinks she's sleeping with her boss. So I get in the car. I'm like, oh, my God. And I drive there, pull in the parking lot next to the massage parlor. This fool is out of his car, crouched down behind a dumpster, peeking around the corner, waiting on her. And I'm like, dog, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing right now? Like, man, fuck that bitch. Like, I'm a fucking killer. That bitch, I know she's fucking sleeping with, with blah, blah, blah. And I was like, man, get in the fucking car. Like, are you, you're fucking stupid. Just get in the fucking car. Well, he gets in the car. Here she comes walking out of the out massage parlor walking with this dude. She's got a rose in her hand. She's just like, doop, do doop, do doop, do doop. And he gets out the car like, you fucking bitch, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, ah. so when we, when we hear songs like Kim or, you know, any of that, like, you know, he's going to kill, you know, like just the two of us. I mean, we know that that's, we, we know where those, that vision comes from, from its places like that or, or at his record release party. What, what, what happened with the story? Let's finish the story real quick. Nothing. They ended up go, go, going back to her house and making up like they always did. That was, that was the dynamic between Kim and Marshall. Fight, get back together. Blow out in front of the whole world, get back together. I fucking hate you. I'm going to kill you. Fuck you. You ain't going to see your daughter. Bitch, I'll kill you if you take my daughter away. And then they're back together again. That was all the fucking time. It was stressful on everybody around that because we knew that that's, 
like Kim was at that time, we knew how he felt and how he, you know, how he loved Kim so much. Um, at his record release party for Slim Shady EP, she literally had to be picked up. So, so describe the night. Take, take me through the night as a whole. Uh, my group is one of the openers. Uh, Kid Rock is there. ICP uh, was invited to the event. I don't think they showed up, or I don't. I don't people, some people say they saw them there, but I never saw them there. Um, it's at a small little place called the Impound. Um, it's on the east side of Detroit. There was probably 50, 60 people in the whole place, um, but it was off the hook. Um, a couple other groups performed as well, but the flyer, the, inv the invite list that went out for the flyer, there wasn't a, a MC, a group, a B-boy, a B-girl, a DJ, a graph writer that was not invited to this event. But we were such a small, tight-knit community that it wasn't like Detroit hip hop had fans, if that makes sense. Like we didn't have fans, right. we all supported each other, so we were fans of each other. So we all showed up to each other's events all the time. Like Slum Village might come out to somebody's show or, or somebody that, then they'd go to the Slum Village show or, you know, or same with, you know, D12, any members of D12, like, and, uh, but at some point she gets jealous. She gets jealous of him being, you know, looking like he's getting some love, you know, like not from a woman, but getting, just getting fan love, getting, getting love from from the crowd, getting love from, you know, his peers. And she didn't like that. The attention's not on her. So she picks a fight with him in front of everybody. This is, the, this is his big night. The Slim Shady EP was for him in Detroit. This is before Dre, right? This was right before Dre. This was the, this was the biggest unsigned record release party, like, as far as like the, the, the buildup of it, the adrenaline of it um, was incredible. Because then he got on the mic and he killed it. He did like, you know, a, a 20 minute set or something like that and just murdered it. And um, she, couldn't, she couldn't take it. And she started a fight with him and people had to get in the middle and I'm grabbing him and the Bass Brothers are, are kind of like getting them in the middle. She literally spit on him right in his face in front of everybody. Spit, I mean, it hit his face. Some of it probably fell on me. I was that close. And she had to be dragged out of his record release party and was not allowed back in, wow. okay? Then he writes a song like Just the Two of Us. So, okay. If it makes sense, you know what I mean? Like, that, like that, that's where you kind of get the idea of that stuff. Like, you know, just the two of us was done, but that, that's where it, that's where that mentality comes from. You know, like he, he writes the song, he writes the song, you know, he fights with her, he gets back with her, they fight together, they get back together. Then he writes the song, you know, and then he performs it. And she's there. <laughs> What'd she think about it? Well, I'm not, I doubt she loved it. The other, you know, at, then what does this fool do? He goes and gets a tombstone on his belly tattooed with the name Rotten Pieces, and it says Kim. Right. Can't like that either. She, she couldn't have loved that, you know? Yeah. But, I, but I'll tell you what, I, I don't know anybody. I mean, I had my own, I had record deals and all that, and I saw my production value go up, but I never really felt like my rhymes went up a notch. Even when I had a, a major record deal. Like I could feel my syllables there, I could feel my metaphors there, I could feel what I was getting across there, but I just felt like, eh, that maybe this ain't the one, the next one I'm really gonna be in my zone. With Marshall, totally different. Like, from Slim Shady EP to My Name Is and Still Don't Give a Fuck, I was like, 
we used to say, this dude's out of here. Now he wasn't really, he was talking to Bazaar, he was talking to me, but he really wasn't talking to Proof at the time, and D12 really wasn't together. And I remember Proof coming up to me, telling me, Proof came to my house. Proof used to stay the night, stay the weekend sometime at my house. And um, Bugs would stay at my house. Bazaar sometime would stay the night because we would, might be working on beats, listening to beats, whatever. I remember Proof came to my house and said to me, you need to talk to your boy. And I was like, why? And he was like, what the fuck is all this drug shit he's talking? Like, you gotta stop him, man. Like, he's out of control. I was like, man, he's with Dr. Dre. <laughs> I am not telling that dude to stop nothing. So at, at what, were you around before he was on drugs or when did all yeah. that come in? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I was around before, the middle and after. The last time I spoke to him, he was going into rehab, and I haven't spoke to him since. Okay, so that was two thousand six. It's probably the last time I spoke to him. Okay, so what what was what was the like uh, on and off drugs? What was the difference? Wow. Well, it was it was it was very different, very very different. Like I said, remember when I told you they used to have the hat brimmed down and didn't make eye contact and, you know, really meticulous and articulate and, you know, and just like a, a spitter. He was just, you know, he just machine gunning raps into the crowd. That's what he was focused on back then. He wasn't on drugs then. He barely drank, to be honest with you. Barely drank. I, I mean, I don't think I've... I don't think I ever, I think I might have saw him like smoke weed once. Between 96 and 99. So those three years, 95 to 99, excuse me, those four years, I didn't see him. I might have saw him smoke one joint and that's about it. Or, or and maybe you know maybe he drank a 40 with us or something like that but you know that was basically it his first show after he got signed to dre was called the aftermath rave it was a rave and it was my group as an opener uh i believe the brigade which which eventually um which the brigade was mr porter and caniva um, and which eventually they ended up in D12. They were already a part of D12 before, but they had their own group called the Brigade. I believe they performed. I know Bizarre performed. Um, and I remember seeing him, he had the blonde hair. And I had seen him with the blonde hair before, but for the first time performing and doing whippets in the, in the back. And he was on 10. I had never seen him like this before, ever. You know, just bug-eyed, you know. For, for people who watch him, what's Whippets? So, there would be a, like, like the helium balloon tanks, okay, like that. So you'd have a nitrous oxide tank, and you'd fill it up with a balloon, fill it up in a balloon, and you'd inhale that. And they used to sell those balloons at parties, at raves, at, um, at after-hour spots for like five bucks. It's the same, you'd get the same effect um, from a Cool Whip can that you just spray it when there's no more Cool Whip in it, you could get high off of the, the contents of it. And that nitrous, inhaling that nitrous oxide will get you high. Um, and it also fries the shit out of your brain cells. Um, yeah, so I'd seen him on 10 doing that. Um, was that the first drugs you seen him doing? No, I seen him do Tylenol 3s a lot. What's a, uh, what's a Tylenol 3? Tylenol 3 is a painkiller. It's like the, it's the next step of, it's, it's the, you know, you take a couple Tylenol for a headache to go away, right? All right. 
if you sprained your ankle, a Tylenol 3 would, you'd, you, it would make you feel better. You wouldn't feel that pain. Oh, so okay. it's just the next step. So he was just popping pain, he, kind of like pain pills, but Tylenol. Exactly. He would take Tylenol 3s. Um, but, you know, he, he, he'd get them from his mother. I mean, it, the, you know, I mean, he, he documented this in his, in his songs, you know. He, like in the one song where he says, uh, uh, where do you think, I picked, where do you think I picked up the habit? You know, like, you know, I, I just lift up the mattress. I literally seen him lift up her mattress and take her, her drugs. So they weren't his, they was, it was his mother's drugs. So he was taking her pills. I remember when he, got, when he was with Dre and he had just did My Name Is, he called me from LA and my girl at the time, she was an ER emergency room tech um, at a hospital and he knew that. And he called me and said, hey, uh, ask Melissa what it means when you, you're pissing blood. And I was like, what? what? What do you mean you're pissing blood? And he's like, yeah, like I'm, I'm pissing blood. And she was like, yeah, that's from the Tylenol 3s that you're taking. Like, you need to stop. If you don't stop, like, it's going to be bad. She's like, you know, the, the lining in your stomach is tearing. Like, you got to stop. And I don't know if it freaked him out or anything like that, but he told me he, he, you know, he was done and all that. He was pissing blood. That, that, that made him stop. But you know what? He, he, you know, he told me that random people, when he got his record deal, random people would show up at his hotel door where he was staying at in L.A., knock on the door. He'd open up the door. They would just hand him a brown bag. And in that brown bag was like weed, pills, whatever. They thought maybe, I don't know if they thought that he was like that already, that that sparked the craziness, or maybe that helped inspire the crazy, you know? So this happened. So he start, So before he, even, before he even started doing drugs, people were just giving him drugs and they just thought, yeah, I mean, and you know, I remember, uh, I remember the Warp Tour. It was like the first tour, major tour he was on with Ice-T. Um, you know, and all the rock acts and stuff like that were on, were on the Warp Tour. I remember people throwing shit on stage, like throwing blunts and fucking whatever they could, throwing pills on stage. I remember that shit. I'm mean, not saying he would pick them up off the nasty stage and do it, but you know, people he, hear that persona, see that persona. Now they're gonna feed that persona. You know, I know there were I know there was probably people around back then who were like, you know, could give him whatever he wanted. You know, I mean, there was one time. I mean, there was there was a few times like I, I was I was scared for my man. You know, he, he almost OD'd or something or no, I didn't see w w when I heard that he told when he told that story that he had OD'd. I wasn't around for that, but I was around for the times of telling him like, yo, man, you need to you need to chill. Like he was I remember he see he's such a studio rat, you know, in the studio all the time. That's that's his that's really his drug, the studio. He's got a studio in his house, you know, he's, I mean, I, I don't know if he's got a studio in his house now, but back then he had a studio he could go to and he had a studio in his house. He'd do eight hours in the studio. He'd get up in the morning. This was after the, after the fame, after, after, you know, three albums, four albums. When, when I was around the studio time, sessions of those days, because that, that time between Slim Shady LP and probably Encore, right before Encore, I didn't get to see none of that because that was just, that's just explosion and then you're just off to the races. You know, I wasn't around for none of that. But Encore, I know I was around for because I, was, I had my major debut on Geffen I was working on and he produced two songs on that album um, and performed on one of them. So, I was around that scene, that studio vibe, and seeing that. 
but he was so dedicated to Haley that he would put eight hours in a studio out somewhere at a real studio. And then he had a studio in his house and those engineers would come to his house and he'd do another four hours or whatever they needed to do. And, and they could be editing, they could be you know, mixing, doing whatever, while he could be upstairs hanging with Haley because Haley was, you know, Haley was always priority, you know. But being around that and telling him like, yo, he, he literally would tell me like, yo man, like I'm straight up addicted to Ambien. He's like, I can't, I, I, like, I'm literally addicted to Ambien. And Ambien help is... help him sleep so he couldn't sleep. Exactly. And to get him off of Ambien, he got, they put him on Valium. So now you've got a guy that goes from being addicted to Ambien. Now we're on tour and he's addicted to Valium. So the whole... Um, the tour that we were on was the anger management tour. It was 2004, 2000, no, 2000, late, no, 2005, mostly all of 2005, because it ended, uh, the last date was Comerica Park here. Um, that whole tour, like, I seen him, and his face was bloated. You know, he, he, had, he had fattened up a little bit. He had broke out in his face. He, he just, you could just tell like, you know, whatever it was, was taking a toll on him. And I know he, he hated that. I know he didn't like that at all. Um, but as soon as we got off tour, he went right into rehab and he got clean. But I know he relapsed, which caused, you know, which also sparked, you know, that album. And, you know, he, OD'd and almost died, you know. But I'm so happy for him that that dude is, you know, who he is today. You know, I think a lot of people who are in his shoes as he is today, they have to go through that in order to become greater. You know, he was always great, but sometimes it takes that trial and, you know, tribulation and turmoil and you know stress and pressure and all that stuff built up so that you go through something so significant that it takes you to you know it the next level there. but you know it's like being me being in the the industry in the music side of the independent side of coming up you know you just you just come up as a as an MC you're not you're not subjected to this crazy life that you end up in when, once you become famous and once you have a record deal and you know the you know the the, the, the crazy stuff that you know like the crazy stuff that people can subject you to so like once you get a record deal and you're out there and you're, you know, you've got hit songs and hit records and stuff like that. You just end up rubbing elbows. You end up being around a whole different lifestyle than you've ever known. You know, and you end up trying things. And let me, you know, I, it happened to me. I just didn't get, I don't have an addictive personality. You know, you know, I tried Molly. I tried ecstasy. I've never really, I mean, I, I smoked weed when I was younger, but it, we never really did that much for me anyway. I just did it just to be cool with, with my friends. Um, now I've never really been a drinker at all, you know, but you know, you get into the business and you get around, you know, certain people who pull out the exotic stuff, you know. And it's probably all free. It's all, it's all free, you know, and, and there's the pressure to be cool in that moment. If you, you know. Do you think that's what it was with him? I think he was just felt like I need to do this, or what do you think actually? No, pushed I him think to he, it? I, I think. I mean, he had a lot of stress with Kim. I think a lot of know? I think a lot of things might have played that role. You know, like a lot of a lot of things might have. You know. Uh, I mean, I can't speak for the man. Sometimes people do it because they think 
I wonder what kind of creative juices are going to come out of me doing these shrooms. <laughs> you know, like maybe, I mean, remember Slim Shady LP? What was in, what was in the cover? Well, when you pulled it, when you did the pull out of it. Shit, I don't remember. It's been so long. It was a big ass house and it was a mushroom. Okay. So, you know, I know he, I know he was doing shrooms and stuff like that. And it's, you, you, sometimes it's just to have fun, man. You know, I remember being at Snoop Dogg's Rhythm and Gangster record release party. Okay. I got invited by the president of Geffen. He was going to introduce me to Snoop because Snoop and I were getting ready to go on tour together. And I'll never forget it because Snoop is originally from Detroit. So his mother and father split. His mother took him to Long Beach. But Snoop's got major ties here. His father used to be my postman growing up. His father delivered my mail growing up. Snoop Dogg's father delivered my delivered mail. Your mail. Yeah, wow. and he lived, and he lived 16 houses away from me. Wow, that's crazy. So here I am now rapping, and I'm signed to the same label as Snoop, and I get to finally meet Snoop and tell him this story. Okay, now not only that. I'm locked up in Lompoc, and who am I locked up with in Lompoc in 92 is Snoop Dogg's father-in-law. Now, he wasn't, he wasn't Snoop Dogg at the time. He was Snoopy, and he was just dating his father-in-law's daughter. So, you know, his, he was just dating his wife at the time. So I've, I've had this like crazy stuff I always wanted to tell Snoop if I ever got a chance to meet him. And now here we are on the same label and I'm, in the, I'm at his record release party and I get introduced to him. And I'm going to be on tour with him also as his opening act, as his co-headliner. So I, I got to make a good impression when I meet him. I told him that his dad was my postman and all this stuff. And, and I said, yeah, man, he lived down the street from me and whatever. He goes, oh, that's cool, nephew. Hit this. <laughs> first thing he said to me. First things he said to me. Cool, nephew. Hit this. I hadn't smoked weed in 15 years, probably. And the first shit I'm going to hit is I'm going to take a hit off a Snoop Blunt Man, you talk about pressure. Do I do it? Who's going to say no to that? Right. Nobody's going to say no to that. So I did it. And the next thing I know, I'm smoking weed with everybody at this party. I'm smoking weed with Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm smoking weed with Justin Timberlake. You know, all these famous people, these A-list people. And you just feel like, you got no choice but to do this kind of stuff because you're, it, it's a lot of pressure. It's like you, you, you're, you want to be in the cool crowd, you know? If I would have said, nah, I'm straight, the, the next day somebody would have been like, yeah, man, uh, I don't know what happened. You ain't on that tour no more, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because if he might have thought I wasn't, I wasn't, down like that you know like I, or, you know there's a trust factor there you don't want to smoke weed with Snoop I might not be able to trust you you know like <laughs> you don't know that's, yeah. that's kind of how people think so M could have been there's a there's a large scale of things that could have caused him to you know get attracted to stuff a lot of it just for fun a lot of it because it was there he didn't have to pay for it you know He's bored, you know, or maybe he thought maybe he could open up some, you know, open up a window, open up Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory type shit, you know, because when you look at his, his lifestyle and his, 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 the way his stuff has always been wrote out, when you see, hear stories like that, who writes stories like Stan? That's, that's genius shit right there. Well, he even, there he even mentions my group in that song. Does he? Yeah, he says, uh, he says um, Stan says it. He says, uh, 
I even got the, under, the underground shit you did with, with the ruckus too. That shit was fat. Uh, okay, he was featured on, what was the name of the song he was featured on? Stan. Stan. Well, no, no, I meant that he did for you. The you we you, Shine. We Shine. Yeah, We okay. Shine. So, because I know they're going to be asking. Yeah. We, Fans are going to be asking. Yeah, we, we Shine. We Shine, he was on. And then on my major debut, um, he produced Hush Is Coming, which featured Nate Dogg. Okay. And then we did, uh, and then he produced uh, another song called, it was, a, it was a robbery song called off to Tijuana. He produced that, um, which really was Criminal Part Two. Him and I were calling it Criminal Part Two from Marshall Mathers LP. So he's got Criminal, Criminal, dun, 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 Criminal. Remember that song? Yep. So we were doing a Part Two to that, and we kept calling it Part Two, but Paul wouldn't let us call it a Criminal Part Two. So we ended up calling it Off to Tijuana. It was me, him, Swifty, and Caniva on it. And it's a robbery. We, we rob a bank and we, then we leave to Tijuana. Was there any difference in his personality from sober to being on drugs? Uh, no, because I don't think so. I think maybe he, I mean, Marshall was, has always been a jokester. Like he's hilarious to be around. He's funny. I, I really believe that that dude belongs in comedies. Like he could write, he could probably write a whole comedy on his own. He could star in a comedy. He could perform comedy. Um, he was always fun to be around. Like he was, you know, cracking jokes and, you know, um, playing the dozens where you like cap on each other, you know, your mama jokes, stuff like that. Um, so he was always fun to be around and, and that sort of stuff. So, you know, besides seeing the crazy drama with him and Kim all the time, you know, you saw three sides. You saw the drama. I take that back. Instead of not three, you see four sides of Eminem. You see the side that he had with Kim. You is that, see is that like the crazy. That's the crazy that's side. The crazy side. Okay. You see the. You know, the fun jokester, always cracking jokes, fun to be around, life at a party, Marshall. You know, we, we never called him, well, we called him M, but people that were closest to him, we always called him Marsh. But then you saw, you know, like the, the savant, you know, the dude who knew every word in the dictionary that could rhyme words that we couldn't rhyme, that we didn't think rhymed, but the way that he made them rhyme, he could bend it, you know, and make it work to that sentence or syllable or whatever. He would, he would make it all work. Then you saw the father. And the father was like everything. Like that, that, that was his life, you know? So, I mean, in, in all reality, out of those four, if I had to pick two, it's rap and his daughter. And that was it. Like that, those two, he was dead focused on succeeding in. He wanted to be a father because he didn't have a father. You know, he wanted to be everything to his daughter and, get, and provide his daughter. That was his biggest thing was providing, you know. I, I, mean, I mean, damn, this, this dude was like, him and Kim were living in, in a house in a neighborhood and the house kept getting broke into by this same crackhead like three, four times. They catch him? No, they just ended up saying, fuck this, and they moved. Oh. Like they took every, the dude like took everything out of the house. You like know? TVs? Yeah. No way. Yeah. You know? And this is, you know, this is where his daughter's gonna sleep? Like, fuck. Was this before his daughter? This was after. After his daughter? Yeah. You know, so it was just like, his mindset was like, I gotta provide, I gotta provide, I gotta provide. You know, at Christmas, that dude didn't have a pot to piss in with money, but he found a way to, to give her, you know, fill up that tree with as much shit as, as he could give her, you know? And that is the most admirable thing you, if, if you could ever say one thing about him, that's the most admirable thing about him, is his dedication and love for his daughter.
and now it's daughters because now he's he's got Whitney also, um, who's who he's adopted. So, you know, it's uh, but you know, rap has always been his thing. But drugs, I mean, I don't. I think the drugs affected him in private. You know, where some people are out here doing drugs in front of the world, you know, trying to impress people or whatever, and, and you know, they end up ODing on a floor. And what do their friends do? Just walk away. You know, shit like that. And you hear about those type of people dying, you know. I think Marshall felt fought his own battles with certain things in private and not in front of anybody. Um, but would have conversations with those closest to him who, who he could actually, you know, talk to about that certain stuff, like Paul probably, you know. Because like I said, like when we were on tour, it was all fun and games. It wasn't, you know, I remember like the first three dates, Kim and the kids were on tour and they had their own bus. And then I think like after the third day, we had like, 25 30 dates that year and like the third date or fourth date like he kicked him off the tour told him to go home and i know it was because he was battling you know battling volume and battling that shit because he had gained so much weight it was he was winded on stage so he wasn't like he wasn't um he wasn't the up and smoke m Okay. Oh, okay. He was heavier and he was winded. He wasn't running back and forth like that on stage. You know, it was, it was, it was definitely different. I mean, that's, that's where I saw the effects, but I think the, the, the rest of it is something that, you know, he dealt with in private. And At around the time that the album released, his first album, was he going back and forth from LA or yep. yeah. to do his album? Yeah. What was going on? Uh, during that time? Um, he would come back periodically, you know, and play songs for us, you know, that he had just did, you know, and let us hear them. Um, I remember hearing Stan for the first time, you know, like that. I mean, that was on, it ended up being on Marshall Mathers LP, but I heard it before the album was out. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was, he was going back and forth. It was funny because the first time he came back from LA, he looked like an essay. He had on uh, he had a, he had on um, Chuck Taylors khakis and a white T-shirt, and I thought he was Mexican, <laughs> and I was like, "What are you doing, dude? Like, what are you doing? Like, that's not you." Like, and he was just you know trying to find you know this new lifestyle that he was thrust into because of Dr. Dre. By living in L.A., by living, you know, periodically coming back here, you know, he was doing nice things for his friends. You know, he would, you know, buy him a video game system. I know he bought one of his friends a car, a used car or a used truck or something. I think you mentioned you were there when he met Royce. Yep. What, what was that like? Royce, um, Royce and I both, Royce had a group called Wall Street. Um, oh, man, it was probably like. 15 dudes in that group. But Royce was the standout, always, period. Like, you could tell he was, he was the front man. I didn't even know Royce either. I just, I just knew he was on this. I knew who he was, but I, I, I knew he was on this bill because I was on the bill also. My group, the Ruckus, was on, on this bill. So it was the Ruckus and Wall Street, and we were opening up for Usher, which is crazy because Here's an underground hip hop group from Detroit. Here's an underground street rap group from Detroit. And we're opening up for Usher in front of, in front of a bunch of teeny boppers, which was just the craziest thing. And uh, I'll never forget, Royce took his shirt off. I remember I got a chance to tell him this story. Like I remember him standing in the front of the stage and he tore his shirt off for all these girls in the crowd. And I used to think, now I look back like, man, them girls are probably like 14 years old. And here's a 20-something-year-old Royce, like, you know, trying to look sexy for these girls. It was hilarious. But, you know, he was all buff and rapping and spitting and whatever. And uh, M came to see 
me perform. And uh, at that time, Paul Rosenberg was, was thinking about managing Marshall or actually becoming his lawyer. Because Paul used to be a, a rapper from here. And Paul decided to go to college to become an entertainment attorney. And then he was going to come back and sign his friends. Pretty dope. Pretty dope idea. Right. More people should do that, actually. Um, so he did that, became an attorney, came back. So Paul and M knew each other? No. Well, Paul, didn't, Paul and M didn't know each other, but Paul and DJ Head knew each other. They were roommates in college. I'm almost positive they were roommates in college um, or met in college together. Um, because Paul Rosenberg's name, rap name was Paul Bunyan. And I, I'm almost positive DJ Head did beats for him. So Paul met M through DJ Head. And Paul came to the show also. Now, I don't know if he was coming to the show to see Royce, my group, or if he came to meet M. I just know that around that time, he was trying to, uh, he was talking to M about uh, possibly being his attorney or possibly being his manager. Oh, okay. So um, M rode with me, came to the show. Um, we do the show and Royce, Royce goes on after us and Royce says this line that to this day was, I mean, it's, it's not the greatest line, but back then it was. He said, I'm iller than standing in front of a gorilla holding a banana. And when you, when you know underground hip hop and you, you visualize that and you put that into a rhyme, like, like I'm crazy enough to stand in front of a gorilla holding a banana. Like, that's how crazy I am. But the way that he spit it was so dope. I, don't, I forget what the line was that went along with it, but M and I just looked at each other and went, holy shit. We went, him and I went crazy. Like, yo, did you hear that? He said he was ill than standing in front of a gorilla holding a banana. And there was hardly anybody in the scene that was rapping like that here. So I might throw a line out there like that, or he, M might throw a line out there like that, but we did that, M, M threw it out there in public, but I kind of threw it out there it, but it, it didn't make that big of a splash. Um, but the way that Royce did it that night was like, we both looked like, damn, we need to see who this dude is. And I believe it was Royce's manager that Royce, Royce and his manager came over, Kino. And I believe Kino introduced Royce to M. And I, I was there. And I remember you know, like, telling him like, yo, that was one of the illest lines I've ever heard. And now to know that that night is the night he met M. He also had his son. His son was born that night at the hospital. And his grandmother died on the, ne on the, the, the sixth floor above in the same hospital. Oh, wow. So three of the most craziest things happened to Royce on that night. He met Eminem. He had his son and his grandmother died all in the same night. Open it up for Usher. <laughs> wow. So he wrote it in this song called Tabernacle. And um, yeah, and then I believe the next day they went and recorded that Bad Meets Evil version um, that I talked about. Also, oh, right after they met, yeah. they hit the studio. Yes. So it was like instant it chemistry. Was, yeah, and they were like kindred spirits. When you heard the original Bad, when you hear the original Bad Meets Evil track, there's a horse sample in it you hear at the beginning. If you listen to it carefully, and I want all the listeners to go and listen to this track on YouTube. It's called Bad Meets Evil. It's the original demo. If you listen to the very beginning of that song, M goes, hi, my name is, and Royce goes, Royce. And M goes, my name is, and, and, and he goes, and he says, 
Slim Shady, which ends up, M ends up playing that demo for Dre, letting him hear that. And that high, my name is, ends up the first single chorus for his debut. Right. So had he not met Royce, who knows if that hook even would have been spawned. You know what I mean? Who knows what would have, what have really would have been the first single. Mm. You know, but that track alone was, when they were done with that track, that, that tape got dubbed so many times here. Like in the underground, people were re quick to, to dub that tape. Yo, you gotta hear this. Arsonist, blocking a fire hose with the nozzles. Something like that. It, I think that's what, the, that's what Royce's first line is, arsonist. Blocking the fire where, blo blocking the water where the fire, something like that. Blocking the fire hydrant where the nozzle is. It's crazy. Right. And now look at him. Yeah. Royce, is, Royce is a legend. Yeah, they're killing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at one point, he offers you a deal. Yeah. What happens with that? Well, I had, I had my group, the Ruckus, and we we were blowing up. Was it, okay? So this was ninety-seven, ninety-eight. Okay, so this was right after he met Dre and dropped his first album. So he goes ahead and drops his first album. Between ninety-seven and ninety-nine, my group is blowing up here. Okay. Um, and we're making a lot of noise, um, and we got a couple record deals on the table. Uh, Rough House Columbia. Uh, we had another record deal on the table with Twism, uh, which was Shaquille O'Neal's label, which people confront on Shaq, but Shaq had platinum albums. So, and we knew Shaq had money. So we knew, and we knew Shaq respected hip hop. So we were really looking at Shaq's label the most. Um, and we were really, my, my group partner, Uncle Lil, and I, we, we were really thinking it was going to happen for us. Um, M gets his deal. M puts out Slim Shady LP. It blows up. And in between Slim Shady LP and Marshall Mathers LP, okay, in between his first and second album, Jimmy Iovine offers him his own distribution for his own record label. So Paul and M and Jimmy start Shady Records together. And Interscope is going to distribute it. I know M went to Bazaar and, and offered Bazaar a solo deal. I know that for a fact, because M told me. So M came to me at St. Andrews Hall. He came, he came into town so excited because Jimmy had just offered him $2 million to start Shady. And he says to me, I already got bizarre. Like, I want to sign you. And I was like, damn. I was like, dude, like, my group's like making noise right now. Like, we got like two, three record deals on the table. I don't know. I'm like, why don't you want to sign us as a group? And he was like, nah, like, like I don't like, I, he goes, no offense. Like, and he was cool with my group partner. He actually knew my group partner before he knew me. He just was like, no offense, but I just don't think dude's dope. I don't think he's dope enough that I can, I can take him to the next level like that. He's like, but you're dope. Like, like he really liked my, st a lot of times he liked a lot of the stuff that I did because it was a lot of my stuff was political based, some of the stuff. So if it was anti-government, stuff like that, because Chuck D was like one of my idols, still is to this day. Um, so I love the political and, and the revolutionary stuff. So M, M liked that side of me. Plus, I think he liked it because that was total opposite of him. So it wasn't going to clash with him. But he was like, yo, I don't, I don't think Ill's dope. Like, I think you're dope. Uncle Ill is not dope. But I think you're dope. Like, I'm, I'm, let's do it. I said, man, like. You know, let me, let me talk to my man first because we got these deals on the table. I'm a very loyal dude. Like, I don't want to, I can't just leave my man. 
So I go back, I go back to the cut and I talk to him. And he's like, why don't you do it? I'm like, dog, like, I'm not gonna, I don't leave, I'm not leaving my group partner. I'm loyal. Like, I, that, I said, how's that gonna look? Like, I, I bounced on you to go get a record deal? And he was like, yeah, but then you can come back and put up. I'm like, I'm, that, that's whack. If we're gonna come out, we're gonna come out together. If we don't come out together, then we split up. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. That's just, that's all it's gonna be. I said, but I'll tell you what, we got these deals on the table, let's see where the deals go, and then, you know, whatever. So, I remember a couple weeks after that, AOL and Time Warner merged, and when they merged, all of the sub-labels in the business got dropped. So any major independents that had any sub-labels through their artists underneath them, they got dropped. So like Corrupt had Entra Records, that got dropped. Cube had Lynch Mob Records, that got dropped. Even Shaq, Shaq had Twism, that got dropped. Like Rough House got dropped. All these, all these labels just got, ended up go, disappearing because they were just like, you know, they're just spending too much money and there's no profits in it. So they're just like, let's just get rid of them, keep what we got, we'll just clean house. Well, when it happened, him and I were like, yo, like, what the fuck? Like, now what do we do? Because that was our, that was our fucking, that was our road. So we, him and I kind of, I don't want to say we stopped talking, but we kind of just started to grow apart because I started to write. You and your partner? Yeah, okay. we started to grow apart. And we just started growing apart because I was producing all of the tracks, writing the choruses or coming up with ideas for the choruses and writing my bars. So I'm doing three things, but the icing on the cake for me was I wrote this song called Now I Need It. It was like now, and it was, it took a domino hook, domino. Remember domino, ghetto jam? Yeah. He had a hook where he said, or he had a, a line where he said, uh, now I need a bitch so I can handle my business. So I took that as the hook in this track and I wrote, I think I wrote two verses and had that as a hook. It was a real small two and a half minute song. And I played it for my man. He was like, just let me spit the second verse. And I'm thinking, dog, all you gotta do is write a verse. You don't have to produce it. You don't have to write hooks. You don't gotta come up with the hooks. All you gotta do is write a verse. You have the easiest part of this job. And now you wanna spit something that I wrote. I was like, yo, that to me, that was like the last straw for me. So I decided to go solo uh, and I go, I, I'll never forget it. I went to Kim's house because M was, M and Kim were living together at Kim's parents' house. Um, this was, this was, uh, he hadn't bought a house yet. And so this was after everything came out. And he still rich, hadn't bought a house. He was and still, he still living. Hasn't bought a house. Nope. And he's living at Kim's mom's. Kim's with mom. With Kim and, and the her baby. parents. And, and her baby. baby. Okay. Yes. Um, so I go there and I said, yo, I said, is that uh, offer still on the table? And he just looked at me like, oh, like, damn. And I was like, I said, well, we just lost our deals because of this merger. I said, and I, I told him everything that was going on with Ill and I, like, you know, I just feel like I'm doing all the work and Ill's not putting in the work. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm ready to go solo. Like, and he was like, dude, I can't do it. He's like, I literally just signed a letter of intent with D12. So he tells me that he's got a, he's like, man, I've got, I just signed a letter of intent with D12. Now D12, they used to be together, but at some point they all went their separate ways to do separate groups and, and whatever. Proof at Five Ella, um, Mr. Porter had the brigade. Um, then there was uh, Swifty had a group called the Rabies. Um, and then M was doing his solo stuff. So they're really, you know, and Bugs was solo. 
Um, so there really was, um, and Swifty really was, Swifty wasn't in the group at the time because it was Bugs, and then Bugs got murdered, um, and then that's when Swifty came and jumped in D12. But they had a letter of intent for, all, for, for D12 as a group, and that was going to be his first project. And he literally told me, like, dude, he was like, this is going to be a project. He's like, you know, I'm going to have to help write the choruses and, you know, the hooks. I got to make it, I got to help it sell. You know, he's like, it's going to take up a lot of my time. So, that, like, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. So I did. I kept on doing what I was doing, and four years later, I got my deal. And uh, I remember uh, I, did a, I did a show at the Viper Room in L.A., and uh, Jimmy Iovine's best friend, Tom Panunzio, came to my show, and he told my manager, like, 30 seconds into the first song, like, I'm signing him. Like, it wasn't even, like, a doubt in his mind. Like, and I had already did a huge showcase in New York in front of all the record labels, um, and they were ready f to sign me in New York, but my manager was like, I already got this set up. Like, you're, you're, you're good. Just come to L.A., you're golden. And so Jimmy Iovine's boy came, and Tom was like, yeah, like, stay in L.A. Like, I want to set this meeting up. I want you to meet with Jimmy. So I met with Jimmy, and Jimmy was like, you know, what's your relationship like with M? And I was like, well, you know, it's been a minute since we talked, because four years had passed. And I just spent my time on the grind at that point and just took his advice, you know. And uh, he was like, all right, well, you know, he's like, let me talk to, you know, Marshall and see what's up. And uh, Marshall was on his way to, to um, New York. Jimmy was picking him up from L.A. and coming here, picking him up and taking him to New York to uh, mix down the Tupac album that he produced. And it was on that plane that Jimmy was like, you know, what, what do you think of this Hush dude? And Emma was like, he's dope. You should sign him. And like a week later, Jimmy flew me out, put me up to Four Seasons, like gave me, gave me a, a, a great deal. Nice, nice chunky advance. And I got to work, you know. He asked me who I wanted to work with. I told him Nate Dogg, they made that happen. M actually wanted me to work with Nate Dogg too. So it was kind of like a, M thought it, I thought it, and Jimmy made it happen. But he had heard it from both our sides without me or M even talking to each other, which was really weird. And it ended up being on an M track, so I was happy about that. Um, M had already guaranteed me that he'd produce a couple of the songs and do the hook on at least one of them. He said he'd give me a verse on my second album but I never got a second album. But, you know, I'm happy with 10 minutes of fame. Like, I'm not that dude that needs to be this guy. You know, like, it was, it was a fun, fun run. I did a track with Talib Kweli. I did a track with a Pussycat Dial. I even did a track with Phil Campbell from Motorhead. So, and then I also put on a, a producer who produced seven tracks on my debut album, and that dude went on to produce uh, all the One Direction albums and produced all the hits. So, yeah, man, I had a good, I had a nice little time. I had a nice run. Got to go on tour with Snoop, got to go on tour overseas with Snoop, did the Rhythm and Gangsta tour, went on tour with M for the Anger Management Tour, opened up for him at the, at the, at the Tiger Stadium here. Opened up, you know, did, did, I did a lot of shit. It was, it was a lot of fun. Saw a lot of shit, <laughs> a lot of crazy shit. Being in Madison Square Garden and Yayo and, and uh, Buck getting arrested for having a pistol on the bus and. Tell well, what, what happened there? They got, the, the bus got pulled over by the hip hop police and they had guns. And so they didn't get to perform in Detroit because they got arrested at Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden was our date right before Detroit. So we knew we were gonna go do- Did you see do, him getting arrested? Yeah, they got right in front of me. Right in front of my van. The police did? Yeah. Pulled them over? Yeah. They pulled everybody out of the so bus? So their, their bus, they had like two buses. 50 had his own bus. Yayo and them had their own bus. And I was behind them and 
cops swooped in in the middle of us. Made them, made, went on the bus, and that's when they found the guns and arrested them right on the bus. Did everybody on the bus get arrested, or? No, nope, just just uh, oh. Banks and uh, Buck. Banks and Buck. Yep. Uh. Yeah, and then. Uh, what were some of the cra crazy uh, tour stories you had with Eminem? You know what, M really M. On tour, M is. M is quiet. He's not what you think he is. Like, he's not out. Because he's so, he was so much of a star at that point, like he wanted to always be the guy that was in the in the back. Quiet, I'd like put it this way: when he would come off tour before I had my record, or went around that time I had a record deal. If we were going to the mall, this is way after. I mean, this is like after. This is after encore and shit. If we were going to the mall, he would put on a disguise. And we'd go to like Macy's. And I remember going to Macy's one time and this lady was like, what's wrong with your friend? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, he looks sick. Like there's something wrong with him. Like he needs to go to the hospital. And if you looked at him, he wore a prosthetic nose and shit and the shit was all fucked up. Oh, like it just, he didn't look right. <laughs> like um, another person like told me like, yo, I know who that is. And I was like, well, don't say nothing. You know, M is, M is, Behind the scenes, he likes, he likes that. He don't like being out in front of people. So tour, it, the, the tour stories was more proof. Proof was crazy. Proof would drive around squirting guns at fans and paintballing and just being crazy, fun, you know, just, I mean, he was, you, you might be walking and proof would jump on your back and bite you and just be crazy. Like he was just, he was the he was the fun, fun one, on tour. You'd mentioned Cheddar Bob. Yeah. Is there a truth to the this Eight Mile? So, Cheddar Bob is really DJ Rec. Okay. R E C DJ Rec. Um, we used we called him Drunk Bob. Because. Every time we saw him, he had a beer in his hand, a 40 in his hand or whatever. So we always called him Drunk Bob. But Bob was, Bob was older than us. And Bob was like, you know who Cut Chemist is? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, so Cut Chemist is from the West Coast. He was part of Jurassic Five. Okay. okay? He reminds me of Cut Chemist in the way that Cut Chemist was all about records and like his record collection. And he had the dope loops, the dope samples, like, like his knowledge of hip hop is unmatched. Like he was our Yoda, right? But in 8 Mile, you know, they had to switch it. The names had to be changed to protect the innocent. So he changed Drunk Bob to Cheddar Bob. Now, if you see the, if you see the scene where the guy is fucking Brittany Murphy in the radio station, okay, right? Yeah. And then M busts in and they get into a fight. My man's nose gets broke. That character is based on me and Champ. So Champ was fucking trying, Champ's the whole. Okay, so that's that, based off a real. That's situation. based off that. The whole movie is based off the whole real situation. The guy that, that you know, was fucking Brittany Murphy was the same guy that kept telling him, like, yo, I'm going to get you a deal. I'm going to hook you up. I got you. Mm. Whatever. You need, like, you know, whatever. Yeah, all that stuff was pretty real. Okay, so, but did Cheddar Bob shoot himself? But Cheddar Bob never shot himself. Okay. And he didn't, he never talked slow like that. He just, he was just a very uh, nonchalant of a person. And he was my DJ. He was, you know, he was, so he was, like I said, he was the first person I ever met in the scene here, ever. And DJ Rec, we call him Cheddar Bob now because that's, he's going to live in infamy as, as that now. He's not known as DJ Rec. He's known as DJ Rec to me, but he's known as Cheddar Bob because his real name is Robert, Robert Claus. Like Santa Claus. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, 
Are there shout, any out, shout out Robert Claus on Facebook, R-O-B-E-R-T-C-L-A-U-S. He's going to love that. Is there any other scenes from A Mile that, that uh, you could think of that are, you know, that he, situations that you've seen? You know what? It's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, the part where he wins the battle and then Proof says, oh, you know, now you're going to host it. And he's like, nah, man, that's you. So that character was based off of Proof. That's, yeah, Mackay Pfeiffer's character is Proof. And it wasn't, uh, what was his name? World or World Peace or I don't know, I forget what his name was in the movie. I forget too. Um, but uh, fans are going to kill us. I know, but you know, <laughs> I lived it. I they're going to know. <laughs> I lived it. I know. I know exactly <laughs> what it is. But yeah, so after M won the hip hop shot battle, if you won the hip hop shot battle, you had to host the next week, the ne the next Saturday they had. So they had it like once a month on on Saturday from like noon to two or ten to two or. Noon, noon, yeah, I think it was noon to two. It was only two hours. And it was at Maurice Malone's hip hop shop. But M won the battle and he was supposed to host. And he told Proof, like, dude, I ain't hosting. That's you. Oh, okay. So that, that was real. Proof, that Mackay Pfeiffer looked like Proof for real, for real back then. Proof's dreads were just like that. Okay, so he had dreads and oh, everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Proof was part of a group called Five Ella. They all had dreads. Um, I believe Jay Dilla had had dreads at one point too. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we we uh, I mean, we had a, we had there were moments in there that I kind of saw little things, but it's nuances and stuff like that, you know. That I'm like, oh, that's I remember that part, you know, whatever. I mean, there was a lot of Detroit, like like the main dude that from free the free world that he battled. When the dude stood up on top of the car and was like, you know, whatever, and, and, uh, and he was like, fuck the free world, and to that guy, and then they got into the fight. That dude on the car was, his, his rapper name was Strike. He was a rapper from here. He was in our scene he, during that, all that. He was a real, he was for real, for real. Strike money. Okay. Yeah, he was in a, he was in a so group. So him and Eminem not, not for had, real. had a competition going? They never had a competition. But just the fact that he was in the movie and he really was a Detroit rapper, you know, that meant a lot to us too. Okay, oh, okay. So, wait, wait. so the dude in the movie, that from was actually free world. him from the free world. He was actually a rapper from Detroit. Yeah, his name was oh, Strike. Oh, okay, okay. Strike Money. Okay, yeah. so that character wasn't based off of... He was in a group called the Mountain Climbers. Was the character based off real life or... No, 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 it was, you know, I mean, the big dude, that was bizarre. Okay. All day long. Right, That's bizarre. Right. If, if M had anybody that was close to him, more than proof, it was probably bizarre. He was okay. around bizarre a lot. You know, Bizarre, like, introduced him to the outsiders in Jersey, you know, where I think a lot of the Slim Shady style really, really, really developed, you know, and then came back home and then kind of, like, pieced all that stuff back together and started really getting really ill with his metaphors and punchlines because, you know, he, he became an honorary member of the outsiders, Young Z, Pace One, Rod Digger, you know, and then got his record deal. I remember the Outsiders were actually on tour with M for when, when they first um, went on tour for the Slim Shady LP. You know, M, did, M produced the track off the Tijuana for me. And we were in Jimmy Iovine's office. And Jimmy says, I want to hear it. I want to hear what he, you know, because Jimmy was always trying to f listen to what M was doing. Because Jimmy told me the only person he ever trusted around his own kids was Eminem. And that's, wow. I mean, that's a big deal. So yeah. here we were, he's like, I want to hear what Marshall did, uh, did for you. So we play this, uh, we get ready to play it, and there's five of us. There's my manager, my A&R, Jimmy, um, and then there's a knock at the door. He get, Jimmy gets up, opens the door, and it's 50. So 50 Cent walks in, Jimmy's like, yeah, this is Hush. And 50's like, yeah, like, I, I heard all about you. Like, Marshall told me all about you. Like, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. He's like, man, I just thought I'd come here to drop off some shoes because he had the new G-Unit Reeboks. 
And he goes, what's going on? Jimmy's like, well, sit down. We're about to play this track that Marshall did with, with Hush. All right, cool. So we all sit back, chill. Jimmy puts it on, plays it. 50's like nodding his head and shit. And Jimmy's nodding his head. And the song's all over with. And um, 50's like, yo, that's dope. Like, you killed it. Like, he goes, I remember you, man. Like, you opened up for me in Detroit. I said, yeah. He goes, well, good luck with everything, man. I hear, I hear nothing but good things from Marshall from you. Good luck. So cool. He goes, make sure you pick up some shoes on your way out when you leave Interscope. Because 50 had shoes shipped to Interscope Studios and Interscope offices. And they used to be in the offices, no joke, stacked like this. Every size you could think of, every colorway you could think of. And I go, I go, it's cool. I already got some. And I had the originals and I put them on the table. And Jimmy is sitting across from me like you. And Jimmy goes, well, you don't have these. He pulls out some burgundy ones. Nobody's got them. My manager goes, well, who's got these? And he pulls out yellow ones. <laughs> and my a and pulls out black ones. All of us sitting at the table all had different colorways of G-Unit Reeboks. And that wasn't even planned that way. And 50 walks in and sees that. That had to be the, one of the dopest fucking feelings, you know, as a, as a person who's got a brand new shoe coming out with Reebok. And you, you see everybody's just rocking your shit. But for me, it was like, that's a crazy, creepy moment, you know, for, the, for something like that to happen. It was, it was cool, but creepy. Yeah. And M was Jordan. That's it, Jordans. Jordans, Jordans, Jordans. Jordans. He wore Jordans so much, he wanted to get sponsored by Jordan and never got a sponsorship. Wow. Yeah, I heard he would only wear them once. That's he'd it. He'd leave them at the hotel. Yep. And he'd... And he'd he eventually got his own shady shoes, like the Nike made shady Air Force Ones, you know, and, and I don't think they made Air Max 95s, but they, they definitely made a bunch of different styles and, you know, and, and different changes and colorways for them, but. Who was Bugs? Okay, so Bugs was in, Bugs was a, a street Detroit rapper. He was in a group called 31, and Bugs was crazy. But Bugs was, Bugs was like, Bugs to me, Bugs was like our, if you could, if you could mix Red Man and Method Man together to make one person, it was Bugs with a, with a, a dash of ODB. Mm -hmm. That's who Bugs was. Bugs had a voice that was incredible. Bugs rhymes was incredible. Um, but Bugs also was crazy, crazy. Like, 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 he lived with me for a while, and he literally, like, I'm going to get food. Do you want anything? And I'm like, ah, where are you going? I'm going to Burger King. I'm like, dog, I ain't got no money. He's like, don't worry, I got it. I'm like, you sure? He's like, yeah. I'm like, all right. He literally would leave my house and go rob somebody. <laughs> get that money and go to Burger King. I, I, I seen him do it the three, four different times. Bugs was crazy. Bugs would just jump out the car and jack somebody. Like, nah, he's just crazy. Just, that's just how he was. And uh, it's unfortunate, how, but. How, how did he meet Eminem? Just through the scene, like all of us, you know? Were you there when they met or? No, I, I th as a matter of fact, I think B Bizarre introduced Bugs. Bizarre, Bizarre Proof introduced Bugs to M. But I was on the phone when, uh, when, uh, and found out about Bugs getting murdered. I was on a three-way with M and Bizarre. Was Bugs and M tight? No, but, but M respected him as a rapper. As an MC, Bugs demanded respect when he took a stage. So, so Everybody was like, yo, this dude's ill. Like, who, who the fuck is this dude? Like, you know, and Bugs eventually, like, he, he also developed, like, this outsider's style. But he could battle his ass off. Battle, I mean, he could battle. He would flame people. And um, I remember he got in a blaze battle and uh, battled somebody. I mean, he just, he just was... He was, he was legit, 
one, he kept it 100 all the time on the stage, on the mic, wherever. Um, but, you know, he, he was defending, uh, I believe his cousin, this girl was being disrespected by some guy and he was defending his cousin and got into a fight with this guy and whooped this dude's ass. And as he was walking away, the dude went into uh, his truck and pulled a rifle out and shot him in the back, killed him. And mm -hmm. then uh, got in the truck and ran him over and, and tried, to take, tried to get away. But it was, on a, it was on an island, like five minutes from here. It was on an island. And there's only one way on and off the island. So my man was trying to get off the island quick, but we have a police station on the island. And the minute it happened, once shots rang out on the island, people know, like, it was easy to see because it happened on senior skip day. It was the hottest, hottest day of the year. And there, all the seniors in high school skipped and, and go to the island. So that's, that's how it all went down and Bugs just was in the wrong place at the wrong time. My man ran him over and cops chased him around the island. He ended up crashing into a tree. Um, he ended up getting life in prison for that. Damn. But I, I, I was on the phone uh, talking to Marshall and talking to Bazaar about it. We just were like, couldn't believe it. And I remember M getting off the phone and me and, me and Bugs called, I mean Bazaar called Swifty and Bazaar asked Swifty to be in D12. I was on that call. And, uh, okay, and so Swifty was? Swifty was in a group called the Rabies. He, he, he wasn't in D12, but he was like an honorary member. I mean, he was like an honorary member anyway. So he just filled that, he was like, yeah, like, we'll, you know, we gotta do what we gotta do. And uh, yeah, I remember, man, I was, I've got like, I've got like three or four tracks I produced on Bugs. Oh, okay, oh, okay, so you guys worked. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, okay. I worked with everybody here. Like I worked, I did the title track for uh, the Slim Shady LP, I'm Shady. I'm shady. Okay, you did the, the beat. I did the beat. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I didn't get no credit for it because they couldn't, um, they had to take the bass line off that I sampled. I sampled the Sade bass line and they couldn't sample it. They couldn't clear the sample because it was Sade. So they kept everything else but changed the bass line and I didn't get no money for it or nothing like that, but I wasn't tripping off that. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Well, what year was this that he uh, got killed? Do you know? That was 98. I did that. Okay, 98? Yeah. Okay, so this is before. 99. Yeah, around 90. It might have been 99. I think I did it 98, and then it was added to the, it was part of the album as it was, as it was being put together. Oh, okay. Okay. You, you remember what year that was the Bugs got killed? Yeah, same year. Same year? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, it's coming up. Matter of fact, I think in I think uh, I think May it's coming up. May. Yeah, well, that that hurt me a lot because he was he lived with me. Like I took care of him. Like I. Oh, okay, so you and him, you and Bugs were close. Yeah, me and Bugs oh. were close in the end. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't get to see I didn't get to see his come up as he was coming up. I got to see him from like the middle part of that when he was already like making his bones. It, you know, as an MC, and then r his star is starting to shine a little bit more because he was hanging out with us. So hanging out with us got him a lot of good stage time, stage presence. So like I, because my group was like one of the, you know, biggest underground groups or independent groups here, we got a lot of great shows. So like we'd go across to Windsor, uh, across the water here, and do a show at their arena over there. Well, I would take Bugs with me you know, and, you know, we'd take another guy with this, this other dude named Marquise and whatever, and they'd be like our hype men, you know, and they'd be hyping the crowd up. And that's what Bugs was great for. Bugs was a great hype man. But he was so dope on the mic. Like, his t he, it, he would have been the dopest MC out of D12 if he would have never got killed. And he probably would have had a solo deal before anybody.
instantly. Like he was, like I said, he was like red meth and a splash of ODB and, you know, like just, you know, super lyrical, super funny, super metaphor, punchline, everything M liked in rappers. You know, because if you know, Red Man's like one of M's favorite rappers of all time. So, you know, to hear somebody like Bugs who's got a taste of that. All right, well, uh, I think that's it. You know, I, I appreciate you, man. I, you know, really appreciate you. This is like hip hop history right here. And I know the fans are going to really love it. I know lots of stories that I, I'm pretty sure they've never heard. I know I've never heard. Some of it they might have heard, but. Yeah. It's just been written Different about. Different variations you know. of it, probably. But, uh, man, this was great, man. I cool. really appreciate it. Yeah, you know, thanks, anytime, man. man. I got you. All right, bro, for sure. All right, bro.